Hello everyone and welcome back to the Out of the Park Developments YouTube channel. My name is Alex Murray, also known as AZ Axel, and today we're doing a tutorial about pitching ratings and what that means and how to be able to understand what each of those do in Out of the Park. There's a lot to cover, so if you've got your OTP games open, let's dive right in. All right, so let's begin this tutorial on pitcher ratings, and we're going to go to a pitcher's tab and a profile page here for a pitcher. And let's first start off by talking about and explaining stuff. Now, stuff, much like batter's contact, is a multi-influenced rating because your stuff rating is based off of the pitches that you have for your player. So the amount of pitches, how good those pitches are, and then on top of that, the velocity of your pitcher will influence your stuff. And then certain pitches are influenced by movement. So unfortunately, there's a kind of a hodgepodge of different influencers because technically your pitches are what influences your stuff on top of velocity, but your pitches are influenced by velocity and your movement. So it all comes back to how good your pitches are, but your pitches, all the stuff here on the second half of the pitcher rating area, those are all influenced by the movement the velocity, and just naturally how good the pitcher is at that pitch. So the best way to explain it is this. Most pitchers will have two or more pitches in their arsenal. I've never seen a pitcher that has just one. They inherently have a rating for that pitch. So we'll just take fastball for an example. They normally can be uh, anywhere between whatever rating system you're using, good to bad. You know, they can be right in the middle and then that fastball is influenced by how their velocity is. So if you have a high-velocity pitcher, their fastball is better than if the pitcher was a low-velocity pitcher, all right? So a way to view this is that as you draft players from the first-year player draft, I know it's a bit of a segue, but if you draft a young fireballer who only throws 94 miles per hour, but they are only like 18 years of age, they can gain miles per hour to their velocity and their fastball will get better and better as they get more velocity on top of potentially just increasing the pitch quality itself without the velocity. So you can see a massive increase in certain pitchers if they increase their velocity, increase their movement, and increase the native ability of their pitches. You can see some pitchers blossom with extremely high stuff to be able to, you know, just strike people out because that's what stuff does. All that talk about how stuff is calculated, the stuff rating by itself is going to indicate how often your pitcher manages to make a batter have no contact, no contact on a pitch. This is all about striking out batters, all right? The stuff rating is all about minimalizing contact, prioritizing strikeouts and getting people out without letting them put the ball in play. All right. Now we'll talk a little bit later about what to watch out for and what types of pitchers to see. Cause there's definitely pitchers who have high stuff and they're very good. And then there's pitchers who have high stuff and they're very bad. All right. And I'll explain why in a little bit. And there are also some pitchers who have very low stuff, but they're still excellent, excellent pitchers. You don't have to have, a lot of stuff to be good, as well as, you know, other of these categories. You don't have to have everything high up, even though you'd prefer that, to make a good pitcher. You can get away with some stuff, all right? So stuff is all about striking people out. It's influenced by your velocity, and it's all coming back to the pitches that you have because the pitches get influenced by your movement and your velocity. Um, breaking pitches such as curveballs, knuckle or not knuckles, uh, curveballs, splitters, sinkers, sliders, I believe are all influenced by movement to certain degrees. How well you can move your pitches is going to be important to having minimalized contact or no contact at all. All right. Now let's talk about movement because we just brought that up. So movement as a rating is all about either having limited or weak contact or lots of contact and heavy contact. All right. If you have a low movement pitcher, what the pitcher gives up in terms of balls in play is going to be hard hit balls, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a home run automatically. What that means is that whatever the result is, it's going to be hit hard, which indicates that the defense is going to have a harder time fielding it, okay? 
higher movement means that your defense on balls put in play have a much easier chance at getting the runners out because the ball was hit weakly versus very, very hard, okay? This goes in line with your ground ball, fly ball tendency, and we'll talk about that in a second here as well. I want to cover control first. But basically, we'll, we'll, we'll reference this, but depending upon your ground ball, fly ball tendency, high or low movement is going to be very, very, very important, okay? Control, Bobby, right before we get on to the fly ball, ground ball tendency and talk about that for five minutes. Control is going to be all about how well your pitcher can pinpoint accuracy your pitches that he throws and whether or not it gives up walks, all right? Control is all about walks and putting the ball right where the pitcher wants them to be put. Now, this can also be an indication that the balls put in play may be weaker because they're more pinpointed, but more likely than not, the only influence you're really going to see from the control rating is a limiter for walks from the pitcher, all right? So if you don't want to have your pitcher give up a bunch of walks, make sure they have as much contact, or sorry, control as possible. All right, let's talk about the big elephant in the room Ground ball, fly ball tendency, and movement, because this is the one that everyone loves to talk about. Every single pitcher has a ground ball, fly ball tendency, which is a rating behind the scenes, which is basically your ground ball percentage. Every single pitcher has this. It ranges from extreme ground ball to neutral to extreme fly ball. All right? Now, this does not mean that the pitcher is good or bad. Extreme fly ball does not mean they're bad. Extreme ground ball does not mean they're good. It's just an indication of when a ball is put in play, this is what's normally going to be the tendency of the ball put in play. So, for example, an extreme ground ball pitcher is going to have a lot of pitches be put right into the ground on the infield, you know? And ground balls are the hardest to make turned into outs. And that generally is because either the infield isn't good enough or the movement of the pitcher isn't good enough. Because if you hit a ball 105 miles per hour exit velocity, you know, Joey Gallo style, and it goes towards the shortstop or the third baseman or, you know, wherever he puts it on the ground, it's probably going to find a hole in the infield, you know, maybe five or six out of ten times. Now, Joey Gallo doesn't hit the ball on the ground that often, but when he does, if he hits it very hard, it's going to be hard to field. So you want to make sure that if you have an extreme ground ball pitcher, that your movement is good because if the movement is low that means a lot of balls put in play are going to be just seeing eye singles as they're referred to as all right that means you're going to see a lot of singles you're going to see a lot of doubles balls put right down the line balls put into the gaps in the outfield but on a, on the ground not in a fly ball type play all right it's much harder to make an extreme ground ball pitcher but with bad movement be successful than an extreme fly ball pitcher with, you know, even moderately successful movement. All right? My little tip for the day for you guys out there. Now, let's talk about extreme fly ball. Extreme fly ball means that the ball is put in the air. No, duh. It basically means that when the ball is hit, it's going to go up into the air. It can be on the infield, and it can also be in the outfield. All right? Most of the time, when an extreme fly ball pitcher doesn't have good movement, that results in doubles, triples, and home runs. Okay? So... To an extent, yes, the worst kind of pitcher you can get is an extreme fly ball, low movement pitcher. They are the pitcher that's going to give up a lot of home runs versus any other type of pitcher out there. However, if you have an extreme fly ball tendency pitcher with high movement, they will be, in my opinion, and I still need to test this to verify, in my opinion, and from what I understand, they will be more successful than an extreme ground ball, high movement pitcher. So if you have two pitchers with the exact same movement, but one's extreme fly ball and the other extreme ground ball, the extreme fly ball pitcher will result in more outs. They will result in more home runs given up, barely, by a small more portion, but it will be noticeable. But the BABIP on that pitcher, because you can actually see even on this page right here, we have a BABIP icon under the stats area. So we track BABIP for each pitcher as well as for each hitter. The BABIP of a pitcher will be higher for an extreme ground ball pitcher than it will be for an extreme fly ball pitcher. All right? I hope that makes sense, and I hope that at least gives you guys some stuff to work with going forward. Now, let's talk about arm slot and pitcher type. 
the arm slot is basically the release point and the release angle of the pitcher, whether that is over the top, three-fourths, sidearm, or submarine. All right? Now, the reason why I bring that up, and it's not just an aesthetics thing, is that basically the splits of the pitcher depends on the arm slot. If you want your pitcher to be able to be very good against um, similar sided batters, you need them to throw over the top or three-fourths. Once a pitcher goes into the sidearm and submarine abilities, the, um, the, the opposite happens. The pitcher actually is not as good um, with splits, and it will become a problem for that pitcher if they have an arm slot that is lower and lower down into the submarine categories. You will notice that it's in this in the game. The, the splits of a pitcher are going to be naturally different if they have a lower release point or arm slot. All right? And then, of course, pitcher type. Pitcher type is all about how you're going to be able to know what to prioritize from your coaching staff for this player. So there are multiple different types of pitcher types out there. This one, uh, you can do uh, ground ball types as well as a whole bunch of other types out there. Um, I believe it's all generated naturally in the game. Yeah, they're generated naturally in the game based upon the pitcher's ratings. But this is how you'll be able to figure out what type of coaching staff to get for each pitcher whether it's finesse, ground ball, power pitcher, because of their ratings, that is how you're going to be able to correlate which coaching staff to get and pitching coach to get to be able to prioritize their training. All right? Lastly, let's talk about stamina and hold runners and then starters versus relievers and what to look for for both of those. So, stamina. In fact, actually, you know what? Let's talk about hold runners first. Hold runners applies to both pitchers of relievers and starters. Hold runners is basically a way that you can limit the best jumps for people attempting to steal. This doesn't mean that they won't steal. It just means that if you have a high hold runners pitcher, they will be able to limit how successful a stolen base attempt is against them. Not how often, but just how successful a stolen base attempt may be. Now, you may notice that an AI will stop stealing as often against a higher hold runner's pitcher, and that just might be because of the way the game is coded. But basically, it's all about limiting how good of a jump the player gets, and then it all comes down to your catcher's arm to be able to throw the person out at the base they're trying to steal. All right? So having a high hold runner is fantastic for your team to prevent a bunch of people taking extra bags for free. So, let's talk about stamina last and last but not least. And stamina is not an indication of how many innings a pitcher can go. Well, no, I'm sorry. I take that back. It is technically an indication. But there are two types of ways that the game will utilize stamina. All right? The game has starting pitching stamina and relief pitching stamina as you can see in the bottom left hand corner we have rest status for starting pitchers and rest status for relief pitchers okay the game is going to take your stamina as a means by which how quickly your pitcher will tire in a game okay which basically means to say you can have anybody start a game okay you can which is why there's such a thing as openers and followers but you can't have someone last a long time if their stamina is down in like the 20 or 30s in, in the 100 scale ranges. If it's very low, that basically means that the player is going to start tiring quicker. And when they tire quicker, they increase their chances for injuries and they also don't perform as well in the game that they're currently playing in. So you will want to monitor how quickly your pitchers tire based on their stamina and when they are pushing the envelope, to, so to speak, of how well they're performing and if they're going to start deteriorating to the point where they start giving up hits and they start giving up runs, all right? Now, having a higher stamina means that they will last longer in ball games. It does not mean there's a direct correlation to how many innings they can technically perform before they will be needing to get pulled because, unfortunately, the amount of pitches is more important than how many innings they go. If a pitcher has thrown 110 pitches but doesn't have very good stamina, he's going to be tiring very quickly and will be already deteriorating on your mound. You can get more out of a pitcher that has higher stamina and have them last longer. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to pull a pitcher immediately when they start to tire. They can still perform, especially if they're an extremely good pitcher. You can push them if you want to. It just means they won't be as good 
as their ratings are at that moment if they're tiring. But that doesn't mean that they are completely not available to pitch once they're fatigued. But again, it all comes back to how far do you want to put, uh, push a pitcher and what levels of injury ratings do you want to be trying to push them into because once they get into fatigue, they increase their chances of injury over and over. So you do want to make sure that you're aware of that and use their stamina wisely so you get the best out of your pitchers and you don't push them too far. All right? Now, again... I mentioned anyone can technically start. We do have a couple of stipulations for how well a starting pitcher will fare. Starting pitchers need to have three pitches. You can technically get away with a two-pitch starter if they are extremely good. So you could technically have a two-pitch pitcher who has high stamina. As long as the stuff movement and control is really, really good, they can technically start and they can technically do it well. But the amount of pitches is important for a starting pitcher. There is a, I don't think it's a bonus or a penalty, but having three pitches is going to be a bigger influence to your pitcher than having more stamina than less. All right? So make sure that your starters have, and this is just my recommendation, make sure your starters have three pitches. That's going to be a huge impact for you on your rotation. Um, For relievers, you can have more than three pitches for relievers. That is perfectly fine. Um, That's just going to, it's just going to add to your stuff because there is a bonus to relief pitchers for their stuff because they are only expected to come in for one inning. If you try to convert a reliever to a starter, there will be a reduction on their stuff because they're going from one inning and they can go all hard on that one inning against the batters and try to just, you know, be everything in that one inning versus now having to work multiple innings. So, Remember that as well. There is a slight reduction going from reliever to starter and a slight boost from going from starter to reliever. So relief pitchers, you can go more on the pitches, but most relief pitchers are going to be just two pitches. Those are normally going to be just two pitch pitchers who are heavily focused on just those two pitches and getting the most out of those two pitches. All right, so let's end on things to watch out for. Knuckleball pitchers, technically have the ability to have a knuckleball count as two pitches. All right? There is a huge ability in the game right now that knuckleballs and knuckle curves are so very rare to find that most pitchers have multiple forms of those knuckleballs and knuckle curves. Okay? And that's why they're so hard to hit. So most pitchers and relievers, most starters, sorry, who have knuckleballs can technically see a larger increase in their stuff because of that knuckleball, and it can actually count almost as two pitches. So you could only have a two-pitch pitcher, but if one of them knuckleball or knuckle curve, you can almost get away with that, more so than having just a two-pitch pitcher. All right? Also, if you have low control on your pitcher, you will want to make sure their strategy settings do not have them pitching around players because if they try to pitch around players with no control, they're going to issue a lot of walks. Alternatively, if they do not have high movement, you do not want to pitch to contact because pitching to contact means they're trying to get the person to put the ball in play. These are all things you can do in game when you're controlling, all right? You don't want to do pitch around or pitch to contact if your pitcher doesn't have good movement as that means the ball is more likely than not going to result in a hard hit ball versus what you're looking for, which is a softly hit ball. Um, pitching to batters with high stuff is a very good way of being able to make a pitcher work. You want to be able to prioritize the least amount of contact as you possibly can. So having high stuff is always a good thing. But as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to have good stuff to have a good pitcher. You can get by with a Jamie Moyer-esque pitcher who's all about movement and control. Being able to get weak contact is a very liable or, you know, um, reliable way to get outs in OOTP. You don't have to have high amounts of stuff. If you have a pitcher who has low stuff but high movement and high control, that basically means that the ball is going to get put into play because the stuff isn't going to be able to be used for strikeouts. So the ball will be put in play. If you have high control, that pitcher will not walk batters, which means low pitch counts. And if the high movement is there, that means that if your infield and outfield are good defenders, that pitcher would be very successful, or at least moderately successful, because the balls put in play would be very, very, very weak contact and result in outs. 
Now, it could result in more hits because it means the ball is put in play, and any time the ball is put in play, it just means there's a chance that the ball is going to be a single or a double or worse. But for some pitchers, they don't have to have high stuff to be successful. So always be testing and looking around for pitchers that you might be able to sneak into your rotation or use in your bullpen and get away with because the AI is just not looking at it based on movement and control as much as it looks at stuff. All right? And that covers all of the pitching ratings in OOTP. I do hope that you guys found this video tutorial helpful in learning how to get started with Out of the Park. We'll continue to make more videos just like this one, as well as some other ones down the road, so please do hit that subscribe button for this channel, and I will see you all in the next one.